climate change negotiation should continue until necessary. We don't have another mechanism right now, so what else? If we stop the negotiations, what we just basically do, everybody will do what they want and that's it. Or I mean, there is no other way. United Nations were created to be a platform for negotiations, so. I also think the negotiations should go on, but uh, I think the process needs to be well adapted and um, there other partners uh, need to be need to be integrated, like uh, as we see in, in this COP, for example, all the difficulties to uh, to get really uh, the people, all the people on board from from the global south, etc. So um, there need to be mechanisms adapted and developed, uh, really, to to make these negotiations much more uh, uh, efficient. Um, yeah, to start with. Can I ask a question? Uh, the question was about the UNF Triple C negotiations going on in general, not specifically COP. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm coming over here. <laughs> yeah, so um, initially I was thinking if it meant that COP events specifically went on forever, that wouldn't help because um, that would just make those endless. They might never come to an agreement and there's good to have an end date that people um, need to finish it by, but there's like pre-COPs and, and COPs the next year, so definitely until climate change is resolved, then we need this mechanism. Yeah, I think as well for me, um, there's there's no way to solve this crisis without collaboration, as sort of uh, as cheesy as it sounds, and the United Nations frameworks are the space we currently have, where we have the platform to collaborate and such, but I agree with you, like there's a lot of space for streamlining the process perhaps. And I thought the use of the word necessary uh, was a bit interesting because I think we will always need uh, international cooperation, um, uh, but there is a sense of urgency for me in the word necessary as well, which I think maybe isn't uh, quite reflected enough yet. For me, there's always a big risk when we weaken the multilateral processes, we end up in bilateral or trilateral or minilateral spaces where powerful countries can do what they want. Here at least we have a certain degree of transparency, we have observers like us, uh, we have to work hard, of course, to, to participate, um, but, uh, but, but there is, um, yeah, it's a bit more democratic than other spaces. Uh, it wouldn't solve the climate crisis, but it's the best we have. When you said that negotiations represent the most democratic way, um, I don't think that it's a very democratic space, in fact. I think it's more of a game of power. Um, for example, I believe that there are coalitions that form up during negotiations and um, it uh, everything depends on uh, the countries that will be in these coalitions and as long as the countries um, have uh, bigger influence, their coalition will be stronger. So I don't think there is much democracy um, among countries or their representations, but I think that the fact that we as observers um, and civil society is here to regulate everything and to tell them, okay, you're not allowed to do whatever you want. This is what makes it more democratic. I, I also agree with you in a way that I wanted to say, I don't know a better place. Um, it's not perfect, but democracy is not only necessary here at the UN, it's actually important at home. For example, the negotiators sitting here, they get a mandate from the headquarters and the headquarters in theory, get a mandate from their people. It's, yeah, of course, here are countries who are not democratic, uh, where this is a problem, but they are, uh, like for example, in the case of my country, I just come from a meeting with a negotiator and he said, I agree with you, but I don't have the mandate from at home because we haven't a law, we have no backing from, from the society, we have no backing from the parliament. I know I, I would like to do more in the negotiations, but at the moment not possible, so you guys need to campaign <laughs> more at home, that we get a man better mandate to negotiate. It seems quite frustrating you're saying each country has a mandate coming in, but it seems frustrating a lot of being at COP right now, but there's limited opportunities it feels to have an influence on it because companies, uh, countries, sorry, have 
kind of set positions coming in. They know what their mandate is, and it feels quite difficult to actually influence anything now they're here. They, they've, they've already decided, so that's been quite strange being here. I'm here with Protect Our Winters UK, and we're here to observe the negotiations as much as possible uh, and make contacts to be more effective at climate action in future. I have environmental degree from the beginning, so I kind of followed this idea since then, but I think first time when I was actively engaged was in Copenhagen, so, but then I work more or less right now with the SDGs, so it's still part of the agenda. So I follow the negotiations and see what's happening. Next uh, statement. If I could shut down all fossil fuel production, I would do it today. Well, maybe I, I do not realize what is at stake when we talk about fossil fuel production, but um, all I know about it is the effects. And I think that um, extractivism is something that um, have been uh, accelerated during colonial times. So, um, like if I can today say, okay, we are going to stop this and we are going to find another solution, then I will totally be down for it because I cannot agree with extractivism and what it does to many, many countries and many marginalized communities. I think I, I agree a lot with what Hajar said. I think the reason I was sort of Level, getting up and getting down was because of the way it was right today and I think uh, what I would believe in and what I would advocate for is the the concept of the just transition um, and just knowing that currently as it stands our societies are very very reliant on all these things and so many working class backgrounds and so many jobs uh, are reliant on these and while maybe had the statement been if you can if you can change it this month <laughs> and we give ourselves four weeks <laughs> to prepare um, but I, as as quickly as we could the first thing I thought about was my my kids at home my family and I was wondering uh, if I could get home mm. if we do it now in the, in, in the really in the spirit of now because even I came by train, but even trains are not 100% renewable. So we have a system problem and that needs some years. I won't say many, let's mm -hmm. maybe, I think we could manage in, within 10 years or so, we could become uh, carbon neutral with a major effort. But when you take it serious and you talk about now, you, too, you do a lot of harm, I think, to people who sit in their homes and the heating is then not anymore working, everything is kind of collapsing. So we need to change the system to allow people to live carbon uh, neutral. If you would have asked me 10 years ago, shall we be without fossil fuel in 2021? I would have agreed. <laughs> so we need just a, a moment to do it, I would say. I think the situation would lead to war. Like if it happens suddenly, it will be, it's, it's not about comfort, it's really about serious consequences and it's uh, and then we need I mean what happened in Britain just recently when there was no enough gas I mean we saw this reports of people crying just because they cannot drive to the store I mean it's literally people will start to kill each other I mean we need to understand that uh, such fast transitions it's it's not transition it's a disaster I think that I've been involved in climate climate issues and climate justice um, as soon as I started to be aware of my racial identity as I realized that uh, climate justice was framed as something that only white people fight for whereas um, everyone is affected by climate change we're all living on this planet well I started uh, about 16 years ago um, on different levels so on one hand uh, training and development education but also lots of uh, campaigning and advocacy on these issues always together with our partner organizations from the south I mean, coming from uh, training and development education, I know very well how difficult it is to convince people to, to, get, uh, to get them to action, to engage, etc. And, and so 
I appreciate uh, all ways, all different ways uh, to get people started. All heads of fossil fuel corporations need to go to prison. Yeah, because um, I think that they know what is at stake when they do what they do. And I will just come back to my point that I stated before when it comes to extractivism. Um, basically, what they are doing, the Global South, is like um, they are they are um, still doing child slavery, this kind of stuff. And I believe that these kind of people should go to prison. What they are doing is not right. What, like if today we we discover that someone is um, enslaving ch uh, children in the global north, what, what, what will be our first reaction? We, we will say, let's put him in prison, there is no justice. I think um, there are many, many examples um, where fossil fuel companies um, have really um, not only uh, damaged uh, the environment, but uh, in full awareness really um, did also uh, damage to to the, well damage uh, to the people in uh, in terms of uh, polluting uh, water um, maybe uh, also polluting uh, the ground. Let's take just the example of uh, Chevron Te Chevron Texaco in uh, in Ecuador. So for over twenty years they polluted uh, the environment. People started uh, getting um, getting cancer, etc. Ten years ago, about ten years ago, they were uh, condemned to uh, to pay. I just tried always to clarify it for myself, who is doing what like between the sectors. And for me, corporations, uh, they originally are made to make profit. I don't have really more or less anything to discuss with them because we need to discuss it with the governments. Because governments are actually here to represent our interests and they should protect us and they should regulate them. They should tell them how they should act or should not act. And that's why in this particular question, I would say like, okay, I would rather to put in prison that governmental officials basically Nothing against uh, making profit for a corporation. Um, I mean, it's clear that this is uh, the first objective, but not at the cost uh, of, of people and environment. Uh, I found this one really difficult to decide on. Um, I, I think it would be good to see ecocide become international law, for example, and then that would make it a lot clearer what exactly the crime would be. Um, I think there may be some that possibly should, um, and, and you have these examples of Exxon New and things like this, where they've maybe covered it up or, or, or knew further in advance, but now obviously they definitely do know um, the huge problems it's causing, um, and you're raising the, the problems with, um, yeah, the problems beyond just the, 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 the problems via climate change of the actual, what the extraction conditions are and things that yeah, maybe then that does fall within more sort of the corporate manslaughter. And at the end of the day, the, the head of an organisation then is responsible. So possibly, possibly, possibly some should from from that perspective. I think I'm I'm sort of on the same on the same train of thought as you in the sense I think maybe I'm taking the prompts a little too literally. Um, I think people should be responsible for crimes and people uh, justice is is very very important. I think. So, so I I disagreed because. I, I believe it's not on me to decide who goes to prison. I mean, we have the rule of law, it's a big achievement. And so we need to have the legal conditions to say this was illegal. I can, from an ethical perspective, I can say, I think it's illegal or I disagree that this company is operating in this rainforest. But before I send somebody to prison, I need to check if, it's, <laughs> if somebody really broke the law. I sometimes ask myself this question, when did it actually start? Uh, I, I think I really got involved in the early 2000s, and, uh, but very professionally it started uh, with the 2008 COP in, in Poznan, when I uh, decided together with my team that we start really actively engaging in negotiations, in, in the lobby work at the UN level. Uh, we made progress on getting carbon emissions down. Yeah, I mean, um, 
I'm of course aware that global emissions are, are, are still um, going up, less fast than before, but they go up. But at the same time, when you look at the emission gap report um, that, that had been published, and it says that all pledges the government, governments made, the NDCs together, uh, would bring us to a 2.7 degree world, that's bad news. But we need also to understand that the last emission gap report predicted a 3.2 degree world. So I would say there is progress. It's worth, uh, yeah, fighting for for a strong uh, climate um, uh, mitigation action. And uh, there is progress. And I also can see that in many countries the change has started. So even if global emissions are not yet there. I believe the, the, the change uh, is there. Yeah, this was a tricky one to interpret because yeah, emissions haven't gone down um, nearly enough, but the, the rate of change is in the correct direction. Um, so I think without um, the processes that we've been going through, we're on a trajectory for much higher temperature, as you were saying. And so in that respect, there has been some progress, but it's way, way slower than what we need. So it's still, um, not going down as we need it to um, and most years rising so it's, it's not actually going down but we've made progress bending like uh, moving the curve so uh, yeah I think I think I'm still not definitely definitely we need more progress though I think for me there are far too many false solutions um, especially well when when we go back uh, a few years when when there still was uh, emission trading uh, on the top of uh, the agenda uh, that only the co2 uh, emissions and and greenhouse emissions in general they were just shifted uh, to other countries etc so there are still lots of um, solutions, false solutions uh, of this kind. And um, there are far too many possibilities also for, um, for corporations, for example, to, to greenwash uh, their, uh, their emissions. I felt similarly in the sense that like perhaps, um, as, as you mentioned, like there's a difference in the gap reports and, and things along those lines, but our, our systems and what is putting the CO2 out there is still completely focused on growth and profit and all these um, systems or, or ways of thinking which are going upwards rather than downwards. And then to me, the if we can put a general statement such as we have reduced um, CO2 emissions, um, to say well, we have reduced, I think, will only be something we can we can confidently say when there has been a bit of a change of mindset until we're still saying oh well we've reduced our emissions this year but your your motto or your your tagline is still like more 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 then it's just a little bit um in inconclusive for me that we maybe bring our own country perspectives because in the uk here we emissions have gone down and but as you were saying there's still some dodgy accounting where if you actually include the flights and um, imported emissions then it's not down as much as they suggest but it's still somewhat down uh, in the last couple of decades so I think that's why I agree there has been some progress in getting it down but it's weak. For me um, a real reduction has not to be measured in, in numbers but in, but in terms of awareness. Awareness not only among the population, but especially also the decision makers, uh, etc. Uh, if we reach this goal, I think the rest will be history. But uh, to reach uh, there, having uh, or knowing, for example, uh, permafrost, etc., that awaits us. So, I would say maybe this is where a generational perspective can come in, because I say if we want to measure things by awareness, I think we can be very positive, at least amongst people our age. Mm -hmm. Like, it's not a, it's not a technical <laughs> topic that feels far away, and you don't have the studies for it, etc. It's something that comes up daily in conversations with friends. It's on our social media all the time.
I've been interested since I was very young, but I first started getting interested in high school, so around uh, 16, 17. Um, and then I became part of my university association, and through that community level engagement, I found Youth and Environment Europe, which is where I've been for uh, almost two years now, volunteering and now uh, working. I think my expectations for today, I'm really interested in uh, seeing the intergenerational aspect of the discussion because I'm here uh, hopefully presenting a youth perspective and uh, very excited to see how it differs uh, from somebody who might be a little bit older. I feel hopeful for my future. I mean, I can say that I, ca I feel hopeful for my future, but not for the future of my children. I mean, I frankly speaking, like I have one child. I sometimes think like, should I have a second one? But I really think to which world I would bring this child. I mean, I, I, I have one already. Why should I make another one who will definitely suffer? Because we don't know if we will end up in wars and stuff. I think I got up. Um purely in a mindset perspective because I want to be hopeful for my future. I want to be hopeful in general. I think for me um, that statement is about mindset and for me to keep going I need to be hopeful. I also do think that there is an occasion for solidarity, for real community action. The people I'm meeting through the youth climate movement are what allow me to be hopeful. These are the people who will grow old with me. <laughs> we'll go through it together. But um, I, I just, uh, I, I can't let myself sit on the statement that I will be hopeless about the future. Yeah. Uh, I just want to react to what Chloe said. I, well, we, I agree with you, but <laughs> I just didn't came here because I make a difference between my mind and my heart. And I do not feel in my heart that there is hope for the future, for my future, but I want to believe in it. So it's my brain who is, uh, which is so far influencing my, my heart. I can very well understand what you're saying because um, this also applies, it also applies to me. Um, but I also have to admit there are really days when I'm absolutely caught in, in eco anxiety. And uh, especially when, just as you said, when I, when I think of my daughters, um, the elder one's 11, the other one's four. And um, of course the elder one, she, she's, she's also aware of many of the things and, and they also catch up there, well, she also catches up my my feelings. She's not she she's she's aware of uh, the things I'm doing. Uh, what I'm what what am I am I doing it for? Uh, I state for myself. It's getting harder and harder, and it takes me always more time to 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 get back to to be ready to uh, to fight. If I have hope for myself, it's I'm really engaged in this climate justice thing because I'm really concerned and about people who are suffering already today from climate change, who are really exposed to a harsh reality we bring down to them. Um, I have also the opportunity in my job to visit these communities and to work with them. And I'm of course also concerned about my children and maybe their children, but I'm not concerned about myself. Um, that's also the danger because climate change, it goes so slowly. It's like the story about the frog in the pot and you heat the water and you do it slowly and the frog will die. If you put the frog in the hot water, it jumps out. Yeah, I really resonate with what you're saying. And uh, like I'm somewhat optimistic and I think I'm in a privileged position. I'll probably largely be OK um, on, a, on a personal level, but I'll also be, um, I'll find it incredibly sad to see um, the progress that's likely in other areas of the world and to other people. So if that reason I couldn't come to the middle, I don't feel um, hopeful that I will feel happy about the place the world is in within um, sort of 20, 30 years. So even though I think, yeah, personally within this country, um, 
as long as we get on with some of the elements of the just transition, most people will largely be okay-ish. Capitalism can be green. Yeah, I'm just um, thinking, about, uh, again, maybe in some simple terms. I think uh, uh, some companies already trying to be somehow sustainably, environmentally sustainable. So in these terms, uh, capitalism still can be there, how it functions as usually, but it still can be green in terms like, I don't know, we cycle water on a Coca-Cola factory <laughs> or we reduce emissions or like we really do this. I mean, just technically organize it that it actually doesn't harm the nature. But at the same time, it doesn't mean that it will be socially just. So it still like can be, I don't know, slaves involved, whatever, we can get this extra profits from some uh, uh, abuse of uh, people and so on and so forth. So it's still maybe the, can be this classic capitalism, but with uh, this green mark. So that's why I think it's kind of possible. And I'm afraid that um, in some cases, this is also uh, this kind of washing, like SDG washing or something, that when just one aspect is taken forward, but the rest is left behind, so to say, and I think it can be just green aspect taken forward and then it's green capitalism, something like that. Yeah, <clears throat> I find this one difficult because green is a wishy-washy word. <laughs> like it does, it has no real definition, right? And I think it can be green and greener. Can it be green enough? I'm not so sure. Um, and then capitalism is, yeah, quite strange with the that concept, the endless endless growth on a finite planet could be possible is is also <laughs> doesn't doesn't seem sound so um yeah that that would lean me against it being um truly sustainable long term um but i think it can be greener and relatively green and we can make progress within capitalism but it's yeah uh not not a great system for, 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 for long-term sustainability. Okay. Well, for me, green capitalism is a, is a fairy tale, a system that, is, that relies on or that is built upon uh, growth can for me never be never be sustainable uh, and I think that's all I can do can can say about that uh, I do agree that as an economic system based on productivism more and more and more <laughs> cannot be considered as uh, sustainable cannot even imagine itself being sustainable and also capitalism is um, something that uh, is meant to destroy itself, basically. So you cannot consider it as something that can be sustainable on a long run. I can't see us being able to reframe capitalism without moving away from some form of growth. Perhaps we can shift from exponential growth, uh, uh, infinite growth, but still there's this question of um, until what point can we go? And there's this infinite question of resources, both natural and human, and that's you bringing up the productivism, for example. Like you can also think about how capitalism has infiltrated our personal lives and the way we use our time and mm -hmm. And that in itself, I think, is not sustainable. And if we want to apply it to a green sphere, for example, I think us as people who, young people who use their free time during their studies to get involved in these questions. So it's not where we're not at the point where this is our full time or anything. Um, time is an important question and how we use it. And uh, capitalism has also made us think we need to be productive all the time, and that's also not sustainable. So just to me, there for, for a green future, one where 
um, our planet is healthy, but our people are healthy too. I can't imagine it on this system of continuous growth and production and productivity. I've been dreaming to say this all my life. It's a wrap. Hey. <laughs> Thank you very much, guys.